I was born and raised Roman Catholic, and uh, I loved my, that's all I knew. So that's what I loved, because that was how I uh, thought I was connecting with God. And um, I went to church all the time, even when I didn't have to be there. I didn't pass a church without stopping and making a visit. And, uh, you know, we'd light candles and pray prayers. And I don't know. How many of you have a Catholic background? Any of you in here? Okay, so a few of you know that um, we, we, as Catholics, we prayed a lot of what the Bible would call vain repetitions, okay? Uh, and one of those is, is called rosaries. And uh, there's 60-some prayers on those beads. But from the time I was in fifth grade till the time I was 21, I went through that three times a day. I was serious about praying, uh, and God somehow, I don't know how he works all that. He looks on our heart, and uh, he <laughs> hears us, and he's always doing what he needs to do to get us to really know him. But, um, and there's no time with God. You know, I mean, God's in eternity, and so sometimes uh, things may seem to take a long time for us, but... Uh, God's always working his plan. So I prayed three of these uh, every day. I went through my little plaque prayer book cover to cover every day. I had a pile of prayers that we prayed to angels, we prayed to saints, and I did those every day. And um, so if anybody ever told me, I don't know that they did, but if anybody would have ever told me as I look back, uh, that you don't know God, I'd say they were crazy because I did all this prayer stuff. I mean, I was always in church, okay? And uh, I tried to do good even though I failed. And so uh, I did that, and when I was 19, I became an alcoholic. Doing all that religious stuff, I tell people I was a good Roman Catholic alcoholic. (laughs) <laughs> because I was. That's who I was. Didn't know that I didn't know God. And then I received a draft notice in the mail. I was drafted into the Army. And uh, I thought, this is punishment for my sins, you know. And uh, they said, well, you get through basic training and you'll be able to get through the rest, you know. So I did that. And uh, God's hand was with me. Uh, when I initially went in, they put me into, assigned me to a, an old wooden barracks. Uh, I don't think there was any, no, I know there wasn't any air conditioning and stuff like that. And it was down south, and uh, they had fans. But uh, I put my stuff in this barracks, uh, and then I went to this processing office where they processed your records. And uh, a man came along, and I talked to him, and he says, well, they told me that I was going to be made a cook. And uh, I had been a short-order cook in a a restaurant bar as a good Roman Catholic alcoholic, you know. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the ways I got hooked, because the the cook there, uh, one of the other cooks, always kept the bottle behind the garbage can, and <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so that's, that's in the past. That's history. But we can look back and laugh at it, you know, because we see how even in all that goofy stuff that we may have fallen into, God was with us all the time because he's looking at our heart, and he wants everybody to be saved. Uh, saved, I didn't even know what the word saved meant. I don't know that I ever heard the word saved as a Roman Catholic. But um, so I'm going through this processing process, and this man says, well, why are they making you a cook? And I, when you have typing skills, I says, I don't know. Uh, they said they didn't need any clerks. And he says, no, no, we're going to make you a clerk. And so I didn't even get to spend the night in that old wooden barracks, praise God. I went there, had new orders, went to a nice 
three-story building that had this, uh, these three game rooms, pool tables, TVs, leather couches, and uh, games to play. And uh, so uh, that was how God got me uh, that, that far. And I became a, a, what was called a morning report clerk for the uh, commanding officer. And so that was neat. I didn't have to pull any KP as uh, working like that. And uh, so I saw the blessing of God. And so I was pretty much a good boy. And then uh, I started to go out and drink with the guys and so on. And one day I was working in the mail room and this top sergeant came along and he was one of those guys that liked to see people squirm. Uh, and he said, oh, Cardell, that's a good assignment. I said, what assignment? And he said, oh, didn't anybody tell you? You're on a one-man list or levy or assignment to go to Vietnam. Well, when that happened, it felt like all the blood from my feet just went up like a thermometer, you know, and stuck in my head, and I couldn't think. I felt like a zombie walking around. And so one day, one of my uh, friends said, you know, you got to talk to the commanding officer. Uh, something's not right. And I said, well, how can I talk to him, you know? Even though I worked for him, there's this, the power thing, you know? And so we weren't like friendly, friendly. And so the friend says, this afternoon, when the commanding officer goes out to lunch, we're going to go in his office. And I'll sit behind his desk, pretend I'm him, and you sit over there and you tell me what's, what's going on in you. And so that's what we did. And after that, when the... The uh, commanding officer came back from lunch. I knocked on the door, and he says, come in. And he said, it's about time you came in here. We've been dropping all kinds of hints. What's wrong with you? And so I said, well, I don't know. I can't think. I'm afraid of going to Vietnam. And uh, he said, well, would you ever go AWOL? And I said, oh, I'd never even consider that. And he said, well... Would you go and talk to somebody at mental hygiene? And I said, sure. So he made me an appointment. I went and I talked to this man for about an hour. And then he says, all right, I'll make you an appointment with the doctor for sometime next week. And you can come and talk to him. I said, aren't you a doctor? He said, no, I'm a social worker. And we have to screen people to make sure that they really have a problem or if they're just trying to get out of going to Vietnam. And uh, I really had a problem. <laughs> and so I went, went back to the barracks and there was my orders in black and white. And you only had so many days leave before reporting to California to go to Vietnam. I got really mad at God. Now, somebody had given me a Bible. Get a load of this. A non-believer gave me a Bible as a nice gift when I went into the service. God uses everybody, right? He's always working his plan. And so I would read it. I would actually read some of it every day. Well, I took that Bible, and I put it between my hands, and I said, God, I really need for you to talk to me today. I said, I'm going to take my Bible, and I don't recommend people do this, you know. I'm going to take my Bible, and I'm just going to let it fall open. And wherever it opens to, if you're for real, please speak to me through that. And I did, and it opened to the book of Job. And so I read the whole thing. It's pretty long, too, but I read it. And I said, God, are you trying to tell me 
just to be patient and you'll work everything out? I said, you're way out there somewhere and I'm right here and here's my orders in black and white and there's nothing you can do about them. I don't believe in you anymore. And so I cleared the post and I came home on my leave and I went around visiting friends and so on. And then I began to hit the bottle. And I just shut myself up in my room. And uh, it came down after everybody else had gone to bed to get something to eat. It was like, I was so depressed. All I could think about was being shot at, being killed, or having to kill other people. And uh, I couldn't handle it. I remember I wrote all kinds of terrible things on my bedroom wall, and then uh, the night before I was supposed to report to California to go to Vietnam, it was graduation night for my brother from high school. And uh, so we went out drinking. Well, first of all, I found myself in front of the bathroom mirror and it was like I was split in two. And one side of me was saying, you don't have to go through all this. There's nothing left after life. Just go down to the drugstore, buy a big bottle of aspirin, come home and take them and go to sleep. And uh, the other side was saying, no, don't do that. Well, I went with the easy way out, you know. I, when you're messed up in your mind, when you're depressed in that, you do str and when you don't know God, you know, you do some strange and terrible things because the devil wants you dead in your sin. He wants you not to make heaven but to get to hell, you know. So uh, I came home. I took a 50 Bayer aspirin. They say Bayer works wonders. Well... Didn't do anything for me. <laughs> God did a wonder, though. So I'm not feeling any different or anything. And so I went out drinking with my brother to different uh, parties and stuff. And I remember this one lady says, oh, I have such a headache. Do you have an aspirin? I said, no, I just took a whole bottle. <laughs> uh, she laughed and thought I was joking. Well... After I got home, uh, everybody had gone to bed. There was this one girl. She was like a part of the family. She was like, like a sister, you know. And uh, she hung around after everybody went to bed. <clears throat> so we were talking. And uh, all of a sudden, I saw total blackness, darkness, and fire. And I said, no, God, please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. She said, what? What are you talking about? And so I told her what I had done. And she says, well, go stick your finger down your throat. Try to get as much of this up as you can. And she said, and then go take a cold bath. You can't go to sleep or you'll never wake up. So I did that. And then she took me out. I remember it was summertime. We went to the river. We're wading in the river, just trying to keep me. And then we went to the reservoir. We're walking around the reservoir. And I just, I can't go on. And she pulled me up. She's just a little thing, too. She says, no, no, come on, walk, walk. And so she kept me awake. Then we went to uh, her house, her and her family's house, in the morning. And she made me some toast, eggs, whatever. And I ate, and then uh, she dropped me back down at my house. And uh, I was so tired. I just laid on the couch. And then my father, now my father, he was the town drunk, okay? And uh, we had some real unhappy moments at times because of the alcohol. And so he came down. He was rushing around because he was late uh, getting to work. And he looks in and says, hey, aren't you supposed to uh, catch a plane today? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you better get it together 
because if you're late, you'll be counted as AWOL. Uh, I just didn't even want to talk to him. So then my mother came down, and she, you know, mothers got this insight into their children. She took one look at me, and I was a mess, and she said, uh, what's wrong with you? So I told them what I had done. And she said to my dad, hey, we got to take him to the hospital. We have to get his stomach pumped. And he says, I had it with these kids. They take everything into their, into their own hands. They don't listen to anything, you know. Just let them die. Well, my dad knew that if I hadn't died by then, I wasn't going to die. Praise God for his uh, earthly wisdom. Uh, so he went to work. My mom called somebody to get me. Well, first she called the Red Cross. And they said, get him to a veteran's hospital. So she called a friend, and they took me to this veteran's hospital. So I talked to one doctor, another doctor, a third doctor. And each one, after I spilled all my guts out to them, they said, well, well, you don't want to talk to me. You want to talk to Dr. So-and-so. And the last doctor that I wanted to talk to wasn't there. So I got really fed up. And I thought, forget it. I'm feeling better. So we left, and I went home. Well, I thought, I cannot do this service thing. I can't go to, I could do service, but I can't go to war and, and kill people. And so I threw some stuff into a little bag, and I tore out the back door. My mother says, if you're going AWOL, don't ever bother coming back to this house. And so I went, I hitched a ride up to Keystone State Park, and I slept in the woods for a week. I had plans with some friends that I'd come back to our town of Oakmont on a certain day, and they would take me to Canada, and I would defect. <laughs> I was a defective person, I really was. Praise God. So many defects. But uh, God perfects us, doesn't he? When, and once we give him our heart. All right, so then uh, I came back to town. I called my friends. I said, where are you? They said, oh, well, we had to cancel our trip because we had car trouble. Well, I think somebody just talked some sense into them, okay? And they didn't want to be a part of my situation. So who could I call? Where could I go? There was one lady in our town. I went to school with her daughter. Her daughter was a few years younger than me. And this lady, she was so available for kids to talk to. And, well, I was a 19-year-old kid now. I was graduated and so on. But... She was always there with a listening ear, and that's important. Her name was Joanne. And so I called her and said, listen, could I stay at your place for a couple nights? And she said, sure. So I went and I stayed there, and uh, one night after dinner, she excused herself and said she had to go out. And so when she came back, she sat me down, and she said, you know, uh, as one parent to another, I knew what your parents were going through. Knowing, not knowing where you are, if you're safe, or what's going on. And she said, I let them know that you're here and you're safe. Uh, I'm not forcing you to contact them, but uh, I think you should. And then she had gone out that night and she had talked to my parish priest. And they got this plan together that if my father and the priest and I would go down to the, um, what do you call it? The, uh, the what? The army place downtown, federal building, okay? <laughs> he, um, they would verify that I needed mental help, and they would take me and get me some help. So we did all that. Uh, well, I got to tell you this. Uh, my father came one day, knocked on the door, apologized for the things that they had said, and uh, 
you know, we had this plan, and so we went down and turned myself in. And they said, oh, yeah, we, we'll take him to Fort Meade, Maryland. He'll get some help. And uh, as soon as my dad and the priest left, they handcuffed me, and they took me over and threw me in the old Allegheny County Jail. And so the first night I was there in this dirty, dirty cell, I mean, the, the, the cot was black from just sweat and dirt from previous prisoners, you know. And that first night there, I just crawled up in a corner like a little kid, and I began to cry to God. I said, God, I don't know how you can forgive me. I've hurt you. I've hurt so many people. If only I could start over again, I'd live my life different. And as God is my witness, the walls of the jail disappeared, and God took me out into eternity. You know, we are a spirit being. God is a spirit. He's in eternity. He's past, present, future. He could take you into anywhere there and show you things past, show you things to come. That's the way I understand it, okay? And so here, I saw Jesus. As real as I see you, I saw Jesus. But I saw him when he was in agony on the cross. And I heard the voice of God the Father say to me, this is my son who died for you. And I felt a love and a peace and a forgiveness like I had never, ever experienced before in my life. And as this is happening, I'm, I'm really repentant. I'm asking God to forgive me. And I remembered two things that I learned as a Catholic child. One was in first grade, one of our very first catechism questions. Why did God make you? The answer is God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him in heaven. And I said, wow, God, I don't really know you, do I? All of my praying, all of my going to church, God, I want to know you. And then I remembered that in seventh grade, this elderly nun told us an illustration to help us to understand that compared to eternity, this life is very short. And so she said, children, just imagine that the earth is a big iron planet suspended in the universe. And every 10,000 years, a little dove flies past. His wing just brushes that earth. And she said, you know, eternity is longer than it would take for that earth to disappear from the brush of that dove's wing. I said, God, I want to be with you for eternity. And all I said, but I meant it with all my heart, was, dear Jesus, please, Fill me with yourself and never let me lose this peace. I said, I will live for you all the days of my life, and I'll tell everybody I meet that if they're not living for you, they are not living. And you know what? Instantly, I knew that I was alive to God. I knew that my slate was clean. And I knew that when I die, I'm going to heaven. As a Catholic, I didn't know that you could know that. And so we need to tell people everywhere, regardless of their denomination, regardless of how religious they are, that they must know Jesus. They must be born again. All right, so there, from there, I was, uh, after a week there, I was handcuffed. And boy, that's embarrassing, being handcuffed and taken uh, up to Fort Meade, Maryland, you know, you stop, you're with the police, uh, the military police, and 
you know, you can't even go into the bathroom without being handcuffed and things like that. It, you felt so despicable. And, but I had God in my life now. I knew God was working things out. So I go there. I say so a lot, don't I? <laughs> Sorry about that. And uh, I was taken to this uh, special processing battalion where all these guys were just waiting to get bad discharges to get out of the service. They didn't care what kind of discharge they got. Well, I didn't want to get a bad discharge. I wanted to get things right, and I wanted to finish out my time in the service and, you know, be a good uh, citizen and so on. And uh, it was a rough place. We hauled garbage uh, uh, details, and we waited for our turn to appear before the commanding officer there. Well, my turn came, and uh, I remember standing before him in my Class A uniform, and he's about to read off. It's called an Article 15 that has your punishment on it. And uh, suddenly, his telephone rang. And I heard him say, yes, sir, he's standing right here. And I swallowed hard, and I said, God, I know I've done wrong. I know there's consequences. Give me the grace to get through whatever I have to get through. I want to get a good discharge, you know. I want to finish out my time. And the man... Uh, uh, he, he, when he answered the phone, he said, yes, sir, he's standing right here. And then he hung up the phone, and he said, do you know Colonel Messier? And I said, no, sir. And he said, well, he wants to see you. And he ripped up this Article 15 and threw it away. And then he sent me to this colonel's office. So I went to the colonel, and he looked me square in the eye, and said, I don't know you, but something inside me tells me I'm to hear your story and not give you any punishment. And uh, that's what happened. We uh, talked, and he asked if I had been to the mental hygiene place there, and I said, yeah, he called. And he said, they didn't make a report. He said, I'll make you an appointment with a friend of mine there. So uh, he did. And I went and talked to a really nice guy. And he explained to me, as I told him my story, that, well, all through your life, instead of expressing anger in a healthy way, you just stuffed things down. And... Um, when you hit this crisis, it just all exploded. And he said, it's called a mass release of mental tension. And so I didn't get any punishment. Uh, I was, uh, it said oral reprimand, but I never really got a reprimand. And I began working for the colonel. How about that? <laughs> then, they asked me, hey, would you like to go TDY, which is temporary duty. It's, you get to live off the base. You uh, get extra pay. And I said, yes, where to? And they said, to the Pentagon, to work for the deputy chief, chief of staff of personnel. I said, yeah. So I went home that weekend, and I'm explaining to everybody, and uh, they didn't trust me, you know, because when somebody flips out, tries to kill themselves and stuff like that, uh, you have to uh, uh, gain that trust thing again. And I, uh, that Monday morning, I was in the outer office of the colonel, had my duffel bag packed, waiting for a car to come from the Pentagon to pick me up, take me there, and suddenly the telephone rang. And it was the uh, Department of the Army or Pentagon or somebody. It says, is that guy still there? Tell him we have to cancel the orders because we don't have the money in the budget to pay the TDY pay. 
I thought, well, I'll do it for free, you know. <laughs> Just get me out of here. So there I did it again. I said, so <laughs> is, anybody, is God talking to somebody about sowing today? <laughs> maybe. Maybe that's why that word keeps coming up. Praise God. Anyways, I uh, thought, God, how could you do this to me? How could you have my hopes built up and then just pull that rug out from under me? And I really heard in my heart God say, See, if you would have let me have my way with those orders to Vietnam, I could have changed them in the very last moment. And so I began to trust God in greater and greater ways. And I ended up, uh, I received no punishment. I received a um, promotion that year, an Army Commendation Medal for being a good soldier. And then they insisted that they owed me 11 days vacation. And I said, no, that's not true. I said, I was 11 days AWOL. And they said, no. Uh, well, if you have a problem with this, go to the uh, accounting department and tell them about it. So I did. I didn't want to take money that wasn't owed me. And they said, okay, well, we'll put it all through our system again. But if it comes out, this way, you have to take the money or it messes us up. And so I ended up with a bonus, you know, the extra 11 days uh, vacation day uh, pay. But outside the post, I had rented a car and uh, I saw a young man and I uh, picked him up and asked him where he was going. He was hitchhiking. And uh, he was in one of those situations where his mother and father were divorced. His mother just got remarried, and he was being sent to the father again. And uh, he felt so unwanted and everything. So I got to talk to him about Jesus, and I had uh, a good preacher on the radio. We drove quite a distance. And then I uh, gave him a gospel tract, Pray, I think I prayed with him uh, to give his heart to the Lord. And then I said, I want to give you something. And I gave him a bunch of that money, that, uh, that extra money, you know. The young man just began to weep in my car. And he said, nobody's ever given me anything. And uh, so we, there we, go. we touch people's lives, don't we? Just by being good and following those uh, promptings of the precious Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's who I want to talk to about next. Okay? Well, first of all, have all of you given your life to Jesus? Is there anybody in here that does not know beyond a shadow of a doubt if they were to die today, they, would, they would, wouldn't go to heaven? How many of you know without a doubt you're going to heaven? Would you raise your hand? Okay, so that's everybody. That's good. Great. Now I want to talk to you about the Holy Ghost. Okay? And would we go till noon or what? A quarter to or what? Tom? Okay. Let me begin by reading an, uh, a little article here. This is from a Pentecostal evangel. By the way, Pastor, thank you for those songs. And thank you, all you people that played. Those are songs that I love. That in a lot of churches today, we, we don't do those songs. Now, we do them in my house on Monday night at prayer meeting. <laughs> but uh, those choruses and stuff like that, they have so much meaning to us. Because that's where we grew up. We came, you know, in our early days with the Lord and everything. Ah, they, they bring back memories. <clears throat> so 
So thank you for uh, that great music, and you got beautiful voices too. But this is from the Pentecostal Evangel. It says, a movement of fire. There's no secret to the Pentecostal movement's growth. It has happened because ordinary folks have been set on fire by the Spirit of God and have set others on fire. Pentecost came into being as a movement of fire. We will be spiritually viable as long as we remain a movement of fire. Take away the fire, and we are a religious shell. No matter how much we try to appear otherwise, if the fire is gone, nothing is left that will count for eternity. After finishing his redemptive work on Calvary, our risen, ascended Lord hurled the fire to heaven, I mean to earth. Man has never been able to explain it, duplicate it, or extinguish it. Like the fire that fell on Elijah's sacrifice, this is the fire of the Lord. You know, John the Baptist said that Jesus would come and baptize people with the Holy Ghost and with fire. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And it's an ongoing thing, isn't it? We don't just get filled once. We get that initial infilling, and then we need to continually stay being filled one of the ways, speaking to ourselves in songs, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. I'd like to add the truth that fire draws attention, doesn't it? Fire brings a crowd. Just like on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit used the unusual. 120 believers who yielded to God and began speaking in tongues. He used that to draw attention, using, uh, getting their attention. Why? So that they could hear the word of God from Peter's lips and get saved. How many of you are soul winners in here? How many of you witness all the time, I mean, everywhere. I believe in living a lifestyle of evangelism. Everywhere you go, carry tracks with you. That may be the only time you're going to see that person. God may check you and say, you know, don't give it to this one or whatever, you know. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. But if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, we should be doing things for God. Why did God, Jesus send the Holy Ghost? Right, so that we could be witnesses. Uh huh. So I ask you, are you really being as an effective witness as you could be? If we're filled with the Holy Ghost, we should be using our prayer language daily. And when we do, tremendous power is released. In, in the spiritual realm, and it affects what needs to be affected here in this world in which we live, this natural world. When we pray in the Holy Ghost, we are, first of all, praying the perfect will of God, like it says in Romans 8, 26 through 27. When we know not how to pray for things as we ought, the Spirit gives us utterance. We may be worshiping God. Remember Jesus told the woman at the well, those that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And from Ephesians, we may be doing spiritual warfare, praying in the Holy Ghost, using all kinds of prayer. We may be breaking the enemy's strongholds and limits that he's trying to keep us corralled in. Praying in the spirit causes us to break through into the victories that our Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. 
Not only that, but using our prayer language helps us to yield more to God. And it brings us into more of experiencing God on all levels. You could be out working in your field or whatever, and you're experiencing God. God's showing you different things uh, to do and so on. Uh, we have this great intimate communion with the Godhead. And it brings the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. Things are many times revealed to us by praying in tongues. And Jude, verse 20, tells us, do you know it? That we build ourselves up on our most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. I, this comes to my mind, so I'm just going to share it. Years ago, I worked for the Lord at the Bell Telephone Company. There was a lady that worked uh, next to me, beautiful lady, and her name was Ruth. She was uh, from a very strong Catholic family. Her sister was a nun, and she was engaged to a man. She lived on the north side with her parents and her sister, and she was engaged to a man who lived in Burgettstown. <laughs> Teresa lived in Burgettstown a long time ago. And, uh, wow, my ear just popped open. How about that? It was blocked up, and all of a sudden it's perfectly clear. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Ghost, do whatever you want to do in our midst. Amen. Show yourself mighty and strong in our behalf. Sometimes when you're least expecting, he just does things. That's glorious. Thank you, God. So this, uh, I had never had any contact with Ruth outside of the office. It was a Friday night, and I was... At home, I was writing out scriptures. I remember specifically, they were all scriptures that had to do with uh, who we are in Christ, uh, in him, in whom, and through whom, scriptures like that. So I was writing them out in longhand to help me to remember them. And all of a sudden, this prompting comes, this thought from God, call Ruth. And tell her, John is not to drive home tonight because the devil wants him dead. I said, God, I can't do that. They'll think I'm crazy. This was years ago. I'm pretty more instant to obey God now. <laughs> we learn as we go, right? And so I, I thought, her parents would never let him stay overnight for one thing. And I, I just can't do that. But I couldn't shake this. So I stopped what I was doing. I got down on my knees, and I just prayed in the Holy Ghost. When we know not how to pray for things as we are, the Holy Ghost gives us utterance. But as I'm praying, I'm understanding what's taking place. And I literally bound the devil and his demons forbid them to touch John or his car and loosed an angel from heaven to protect John and his car. And then I had this joy in me. I knew, okay, God in his mercy, let me do it this way. And I knew it was okay. Monday, when I saw Ruth, the first thing I asked her was, hey, how was your weekend? She said, fine. I said, anything unusual happen? She said, no, why? And so I told her my end of it. She said, well, yeah. John fell asleep driving home. And when he woke up, he was stopped on the highway, and he said he felt like something or someone was trying to get at him, but couldn't. How about that? For an unsaved person's experience, huh? 
And, but the power that we have in praying in other tongues, we may know or we may not know what we're <clears throat> uh, taking care of in God's business and order of things. But I thought, wow, that, that was an exciting thing. And uh, I know this, that there are all kinds of testimonies. I love reading testimonies. Things like uh, from the Azusa Street Papers. There's so much that's, uh, that you can go online and get these things. How many of you have ever read Tommy Welchel's book about um, they told me their stories? He was a man that... Uh, he was a child. Oh, no, he knew people who were children during Azusa Street. And he used to do things for them in their old age and sit and visit with them. And they tell, the, tell him these stories. Ah, oh, you want to read something. Everyday occurrences, not just once in a while, but everyday occurrences where people without limbs receiving limbs eyes, new teeth, uh, deaf people being healed, blind people being healed, cripples, uh, all kinds of miracles. All because people were so yielded to the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost. And um, when we read accounts like that, it does something in us, doesn't it? It stirs up, God, I want to see more of the supernatural. I want to see those limbs growing. I want to experience those instantaneous healings when the adversary tries to come against me in different ways. There are so many things that God has for us. If we will simply... Walk in the Spirit. And it's a simple thing. It's simply abiding in Jesus, abiding in his word, uh, being with other people of like spiritual mindedness, uh, stepping out, obeying the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But we need to pass what we know and have experienced on to the next generation. Because if nobody tells them, they'll miss it. I'm going to read another article here. This is by a man named Stanley Horton. And this kind of sums things up. It says, on the day of Pentecost, 120 followers of Christ were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began... They began to speak in tongues. It means they continually used it throughout their life. As the Spirit gave them utterance, God supernaturally gave them a language that they had not learned. In the latter part of the 18th century, many people talked about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and considered it a sanctification experience, but so many ignored the physical evidence of speaking in tongues, the biblical evidence. Others saw that Jesus and the book of Acts make it an empowering experience. They knew God had a baptism in the Spirit for them, but they did not quite know what it was or how to be sure they had received it. A great spiritual hunger arose, but there was no Pentecostal revival until they realized Jesus had the same gift for them today. The same. Jesus spoke of the baptism as what the Father had promised. The promise was given to those who were in right relationship with God and with the body of Christ, the new covenant body. Since the Holy Spirit is a person, the new relationship with him is described in several ways. The Holy Spirit filled them, Acts 2-4, 
was poured out upon them, Acts 10, 45, Cornelius' house, and uh, also in that same scripture, came on them. They received the gift. It, that means they actively accepted the gift of the Holy Spirit. The use of these terms also shows that what happened on the day of Pentecost was repeated over and over and over again in the Acts of the Apostles. The only thing is, you know, they, you didn't usually see the, the, uh, the fire or hear the wind. But how many of you know that there are people that have experienced that uh, through the years? Uh, we don't limit God, but we know that the biblical evidence is that people begin to speak in other tongues. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit not only brings power for service, but enables us to worship God in a new way and makes the Bible a new book to us. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you've received it, can you attest to uh, a new understanding of the Word of God, a new uh, experience, a, a new desire for more and more of God? It's not hard to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit because it's a gift. We don't earn it. It's not received because we serve God. All gifts from God are by his grace. I remember uh, in the 70s, there, well, at Azusa Street, uh, way back in the early 1900s, there appeared fire over that place. And um, people saw it. Newspapers reported it. Uh, there was a beautiful uh, woman. Her name was uh, Rev. Ev, Reverend Evelyn Carter. I don't know if you ever heard of her or remember her. But she was wonderful, and she told us how when she was new and fresh in this, uh, she was teaching the youth group in her church, and the Holy Spirit fell upon the young, and there actually appeared fire over the roof, and uh, uh, fire, the firemen came, but then the fire wasn't there. How God, he's wanting, wanting to do all kinds of stuff. As a matter of fact, I wish I would have brought some of those other little books. Uh, I have this little book. It's called uh, Words of Encouragement. And uh, it's all these prophetic things, tongues interpretation that God gave during a period of my life. And one of the things that he said was, there, people would see fire appearing in different places, and, but not consuming anything. Just like Moses in the burning bush. And uh, there's times when it appears. Somebody showed us uh, a couple weeks ago uh, a video, I think it was in Africa, where these people were worshiping God. And there was all this fire that appeared in a photograph like streaming down. I don't know if they saw it there, but it, it sure showed up on the photograph. Let's believe for God to do far exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to his power that's at work within us. So we could go uh, on and on about the Holy Ghost. We know that Jesus put aside his deity, in a sense, and walked on earth as a man. A man filled with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was water baptized, it said that the Holy Spirit appeared as in the form of a dove upon him. 
and or as a dove upon him. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost, and then he was immediately led out to be tempted of the devil. He fasted and prayed 40 days and so on. But the point is, Jesus, if Jesus did not do any ministry until he was filled with the Holy Spirit, how much more do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Every miracle, sign, and wonder that he did, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Jesus led the way for us. He told us, too, that we need to be empowered with the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. It's one thing to be saved and know you're going to heaven, but it's completely another thing and experience to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In every place in the Acts of the Apostles, we see when people were filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke in other tongues. Or if it doesn't say they spoke, it says like uh, when Simon the sorcerer down in Samaria, when um, Philip was getting doing all kinds of miracles and things through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter and John, I think, went down and they're getting people baptized in the Holy Ghost. It says that uh, this Simon saw that they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, what did he see? Don't you think it would be the same thing that they saw at Pentecost, people speaking in tongues? And um, we know that Paul... He was filled with the Holy Ghost, remember? This everybody, everybody knows the story about Saul of Tarsus and how he encountered Jesus. Uh, that's so neat because we, I think we all know some people today, whether it's around us or in the news, uh, people that are so antagonistic against believers, and yet God has plans and purposes for these people. And... I think believers were praying for Saul, right? And when we pray for these uh, ungodly people, it helps to get God's plan in action. Well, Jesus intervened, and uh, he appeared to Saul, and, of course, Saul was blinded. Then the Spirit of God spoke to a man named Ananias and told him, I want you to go to this certain uh, house and... Uh, Put your hands on, pray for this guy, Paul, that he might be healed and filled with the Holy Ghost. And, of course, Ananias questioned God because this was threatening to him. I heard he's come to arrest people. And, but God assured him he's a chosen vessel. And when Ananias went, God had already showed Paul, a vision of this man coming in. God knows everybody's names. He knows where we are all the time. He can give us specific instructions, and thank God he does. And so the rest is all history. But that's when Paul, it says Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost. It doesn't say he spoke in tongues there, but we know he did because of what he wrote in uh, other scriptures, 1 Corinthians 14, particularly where he says, um, I thank my God, I speak in tongues more than you all. So when did he do all that? Probably in his own private prayer life. Hallelujah. I want to encourage people today, before we go to lunch, that uh, if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, that... Uh, you should get filled with the Holy Ghost <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, I tell you, uh, how many of you remember Willard Cantillon? Anybody remember Willard Cantillon? A great old-timer. 
And he told this marvelous story that his mother told him. There was this uh, Jewish man that lived in her apartment complex, and he was going past a woman's apartment. I don't know if it was Willard's mother or, or who, but uh, he heard her singing in Hebrew. What she was doing was she was praying in tongues, singing in tongues, okay? And she didn't know what she was saying, but God was using her. And the man even recognized the song because it was one that he sang, they sang as Jewish children. And so he knocked on the door, and he said, I didn't know you spoke Hebrew. And she said, well, I don't. And he said, but you were singing. They called it Miriam's song, you know, when they crossed through the Red Sea and so on. And she got her tambourines, and the ladies were all dancing and singing. And uh, he said, and it's just so particularly meaningful to me. So he goes to the hospital. He had, his wife was dying in the hospital. He had come home to freshen up and get some stuff. He was on his way back to the hospital when he passed that lady's uh, apartment and heard her. When he got to the hospital, his wife was perfectly well. And her testimony was, hallelujah, that she had this sensation of leaving her body very faintly in the background, she heard a woman singing this song of Miriam. <laughs> and the next thing she knew, she was in her body and she was well. And those, those Jewish people ended up giving their hearts to the Lord and becoming workers for God. Praise God. I w would like to say this. Some people, when they pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit, maybe you're like me. You don't know exactly what to expect. We get these ideas. Oh, I'm just going to shake. Uh, all of a sudden, these words are going to come out of my mouth. But God doesn't force things on people. Notice that it says on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit fell on them, who began to speak? They did. They initiated it. You have to initiate. You have to use your voice, your mouth, your tongue. And uh, I remember my experience. Uh, how many of you remember Russ Bixler? Okay. Well, back in the 70s, there was such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I remember when God gave him the vision for starting Channel 40. And uh, he told us that they were going up and marching around this land and stuff like this seven times, <laughs> like Jericho. And uh, God used all that. I mean, the proof is there today. <laughs> the things that uh, we do sometimes as believers sound foolish to even some believers, but if God's in it, it works. Um, you had to, uh, he pastored a little church in uh, Squirrel Hill, Pittsburgh, and I think it was on Thursday night. If you didn't get there early, you couldn't get in the building. That's how packed it was. But they had, we sang songs, you know, nice, meaningful songs and choruses, and the Spirit of God would move. There'd be tongues interpretation, words of prophecy, words of knowledge, and so on. And then, of course, they'd invite people to give their heart to the Lord. And, and if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, then you follow these people out this door to this room. So I wanted that. I wanted that baptism in the Holy Ghost. I knew I was saved, but I knew I wanted all that I could get from God and experience and so on. And so I went back. And uh, nobody had instructed me that you do the speaking. You know, there wasn't any instruction. And uh, so this man came. He laid his hands on me, and he says, Oh, you're already filled with the Holy Ghost. You're trying too hard to speak in tongues. I said, trying? I didn't even know I was to try. I thought this just poured out of you. And uh, so I was kind of left in a, in a quandary. He moved on to the next person. 
And so I'm on my way home. And these thoughts came to me. I felt I, I did. I did want to make some sounds, you know, just express something. But I thought, well, I can't do that. It has to be God. God does it. It's, see how we perish for lack of knowledge? Mm -hmm. Then I had this thought. Obviously, obviously it came from the devil. If you speak any of those things, those are just words you remember from the Latin mass. When we were raised Catholic, all the service was done in Latin. I didn't know any Latin except a couple words here and there. And so I didn't want to do anything that wasn't God, you know. I, I want to be sure. I want the authentic thing. And I, I went home, and how gentle the Holy Spirit moves and works with all of us. I said, God, I really want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And a thought came to me then from God and said, what harm is there in just speaking out a sound? So I was all by myself. Nobody was around. I thought, hmm. So I spoke a little sound. To me, it was just like a syllable. I don't even remember what it was. An ooh, a uh, or something, you know. And, uh, but the more I said it over and over again, the more other things began to flow. And I had this knowing. I received the Holy Ghost. I have been filled with the Holy Ghost. And so, you know, then God grows us in that. And so that's what I want to encourage you. If you are seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you've never spoken in tongues, you initiate the speaking. As you pray, you could just be where you are and ask God to fill you with the Holy Ghost and then just begin to speak utterances um, there are, uh, I have a list here that uh, I found. Ten reasons for speaking in tongues. One, the manifestation that came with the gift of the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues. Two, Jesus commanded us to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Three, the scriptures exhort us to be filled with the Spirit and to pray in the new tongues of our spirit language. Four, a spirit language is the greatest gift the Holy Spirit can give to a believer. Five, our spirit language enables us to have spirit to Holy Spirit communication with God. Six, praying in tongues builds and increases our faith. Seven, praying in tongues activates the fruit of the Spirit. Eight, praying in our spirit language is the main way we fulfill the scriptural admonition to pray without ceasing. Nine, the Holy Spirit directs our spirit language to pray in accordance with the will of God. And ten, praying in tongues quiets the mind. It does. You need stilled just begin to pray in tongues. You could, you know, if you're in uh, with other people and they don't understand that, just within yourself, pray in that prayer language. It'll still you. It'll give you a peace. It'll cause you to be aware of the presence of God. So I invite you. Is there anyone here who is not filled with the Holy Spirit, with that evidence of speaking in other tongues, praying in tongues, that you want to receive that. Okay? Okay. Would you uh, come up here? Would you mind coming up here? Or do you just want to stay there? Just want to stay there? Just stay there. Just stay there, Holy Ghost there. Anybody else? You too? Okay. Anybody else? See, God, God wants everything for us and when we hear and learn about these things then uh, we need to take a step of faith and go on with God in these things so what we'll do 
is I'll ask, I take it everybody else then has a prayer language and you pray in tongues. So I want all of you to use your prayer language. When you uh, are filled with the Holy Ghost and you yield to this, this prayer language is something that you can use anytime in your private devotions, and it'll help you to build yourself up to be stronger in God. And so that's why it's so important. That's why the adversary wants the pe people to be confused on it and not receive it. So we lean not, to own, lean not to our own understanding. We acknowledge God in this. So I tell people, as uh, you ask God to fill you with the Holy Ghost, then just say, Lord, I want to be a better witness for you. I want this empowerment. I know the Holy Ghost is in me, but I want him to come upon me in this special way. Hallelujah. And therefore, because I believe, I speak sounds, utterances in faith. And I'd like to say this. Even if you would try to imitate what you hear people around you saying, it will come out completely different in a language that God gives you. So let us all just praise and worship God in our tongues. And you two who uh, express the desire to receive, then just do that. You know, you can keep your eyes closed. You can keep them open. You know, the Bible says watch and pray. So it doesn't really matter. But lots of times to have your eyes closed kind of keeps you centered in on God. All right. So let's worship the Lord. And as these people are being filled, we deliver the anula rabraman shito kia tala kelo brane, ila ramanda di adesan domora breda venu shaki ataya, evelian nulo ramama manduri odia labrian banduri adeli shata, cura ma seki legi brando gamba de dia lo bramba di dita, madi video shebro te vore marieto rebia lama, vatre sorica do buki alama de givia du comboto kia tola prapatete. In Brande Budia Jedokina, Silana Maria Loro Shorota, Shoki Keka Yetokiana. Ambranana. We worship you, Lord. Jesus told us, Father, that we would worship you. True worship you worshipers would worship you in spirit and in truth. You speak out loud because you got to hear yourself say it. Vida Lora Brade, Dora Broche, Ebrema Tekia Sheketa, Evande de Bia Dolora Batebra and Bande, Vidio Dora, Papa Cogia Ketisa, Sila, 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 Ria Dolora Badia, Robaria Della Secudia Secadia Sacada, Robadia Seculia Secadi, Selo, 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 Selo Rebea Remadisheta, Bate Shokana, Mavena Manogonda Batike di Prevute, Hadia de la Shara, Shoroba de Moro Badia de. La ria bramande, bodia gedi biate, sevo de manamando, tati eledi brapetu so cotorusta, shogonoma soke, pokemani, media gaba, dia soro brayana saria deria saca dia sacama. Hallelujah. Lord, we, we know you, Holy Spirit, are here already. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are here already, Holy Spirit. You, you're always present. Hallelujah. You never leave us. You never forsake us. So we thank you. But uh, we, even though we know your presence, we're going to sing this beautiful song, okay? Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own 
spirit okay just make your own melody or whatever Rabadi viana mani unimbidelu, gloria la la diu. 